What's up, Browns fans? Jake Burns, your host. You are checking in to the OBR Film Breakdown. I hope you have had a great week so far. Quick reminder who we have had on this week. We have had on Dennis Maniloff uh, just yesterday for your listening pleasure, former Plain Dealer writer. We have had on Lane Adkins, our OBR insider for a Q&A session uh, and, and talking about the OTA issues right now. And then we had on Stephen Thomas for our Monday mailbag. Hopefully you checked out all three of those. And then over the weekend before, if you have not checked them out, we also had Mina Kimes, the great ESPN. Uh, I don't know. She does everything for ESPN. She's a football analyst, NFL analyst for them. And then uh, also Kevin Cole from Pro Football Focus, who does his Unexpected Points uh, Pro Football Focus podcast. He's a data scientist for them. All of those have been great. I hope you have checked them out. And if you could do so upon checking them out, uh, give us a review, uh, you know, give us a subscription first and then a review. Five stars is always appreciated and a little write up. That always helps too. We appreciate getting feedback on this thing. And I talk about feedback all the time. I appreciate any feedback in the Twitter DMs, jake at the uh, where you can email me, let me know, guess you would like anything like that. Shout out to Sports Matt CLE, who hooked me up with a fantastic background cover image. I think you can see it back there. It's a canvas. What a guy. Seriously. Very kind gesture. Appreciate that very much. Um, so we will now transition. Oh, I should say too, subscribe to the YouTube channel so you know when we go live every time. Most of you do that. Appreciated. We put this up on Twitter and Facebook as well for your viewing pleasure as well. We're going to talk Baker Mayfield tonight. And I try to highlight things we have up at the OBR. I'm going to welcome on our OBR analytics guru, Cody Sweck. Cody, what's up, man? What's happening? How are you? Burnsy, how's it going, man? Thanks for having me on. Of course. We're going to run some Baker tape from various games. This is just meant to divert you from our ugly faces. Uh, but we're going to talk about this article that I think was one of Cody's best analytical studies because there's interesting data that drives Baker Mayfield's resurgence, not just from 2019, but I, what I thought was a little bit of a lackluster start to this year as well. Take me back. We're going to start, and if we're going through this thing, if you have not read it, we're essentially going to track through it. You should take the time to read it because I think it's a fun study. The accuracy of Mayfield in 2019. 2018 was pretty good. Talk to me about 2018 and then what happened in 2019, Cody. Sure. When, when we talk about evaluating quarterbacks, I think the most important of the tangible traits per se, one of, if not the most important, is accuracy. A lot of fans and a lot of scouts still focus predominantly – right now on arm strength or well, the guy could throw it 65 balls in the 65 air yards in the air but i don't care about that i want to know how accurate are you from the line of scrimmage to 15 yards downfield with the ball are you accurate are you exact with your ball placement that's where the majority of throws in football come from and that's where mayfield's at his best it is is um his accuracy so that's how he was good in college he was sixth in efficiency rating in the collegiate football history 11th in completion percentage coming out of Oklahoma. So if we look to back to 2018, he finished in the top tier in most accuracy categories. Uh, one we talked about was big time throw percentage. Uh, that's a PFF metric that measures excellent ball location and timing. It's a ball that's maybe a little bit further downfield into a tighter window. He was third in that metric. He was fifth in accuracy plus, and he was also top in more of your catchable ball uh, metrics. Um, that was a great year. I think a lot of that, all of us got lost a little bit that year in the weeks nine through 17, because just how well that offense was humming under Freddie kitchens, which kitchens, I, I love the guy. I'd love to sit down and have a beer with him sometime and, you know, shoot the proverbial, you know what, but I don't want him anywhere near my football team these days. I think Baker has been better off without him. I think we saw that last year under Stefanski, but in 2018, his accuracy was great. But if we want to fast forward to 2019 when Kitchens, took, Kitchens plummeted, he was in the bottom half of all those metrics, metrics we just discussed, whether it's turnover play percentage, on target percentage, meaning is he hitting a receiver in stride? He was 25th in that, where only around 73% of his passes were actually on target. Um, completion percentage over expectation, he was almost dead last, negative 3%, meaning that we could expect him to complete X. He actually completed Y, and his Y was lower than his X. That's not what you want to see. Um, his catchable percentage was low, and his intercept, interception percentage was only second to last to James Winston when he had uh, the ridiculous, infamous season. 
Um, and we looked back to that year with Kitchens and Baker. You could see him. He was just uncomfortable in the pocket. He was sitting there holding on the ball too long. He was escaping clean pockets. He was sitting there with the happy feet, or he just kept patting the ball and patting the ball, not keeping his eyes downfield and doing that. It's now infamous at this point to sliding back to the right and back into the right over and over again. He just, I think it was part of that was because the team as itself top down was just completely disorganized. Nobody knew after the plays were scripted what was coming next. So he was just a guessing game out there. Players out of position, receivers running disadvantageous routes, and it worked against him without a doubt. We'll talk about the 2020 rebound because I think I think that's where 2020 arrives, and it's sort of a tale of three, I guess you could say it third. Like the first third's pretty rough, but then the second and 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 you know the third part of that three stages is pretty damn good. So talk about that. Yeah, I like to focus from that week eight point on, um, not to not to sway the statistics or anything above those means. It's it's to really get to where the offense started to gel. I feel bad for Odell Beckham when he went out in week five. I think he was the offense wasn't reached that point yet, but it was getting there. So once we get to that around that week eight time frame, every players they have a rhythm with each other. They have a comfort a comfortableness, comfortability, whatever the word is, with each other. And um, everybody's comfortable within the scheme. So if we look from just that section of week eight to week six, seven, week 17, he was first in turnover play percentage, meaning that only 1.5% of his throws were considered turnover worthy by PFF. He was second in interception percentage with only 0.3% of his throws were, 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 went for interceptions. And he was third in on target percentage. And when you think about that, some people will be like, well, was he throwing screens? Was he throwing bubbles? Was he throwing a little hitch, five-yard hitch, comeback routes? No. He was still sixth in average attended air yards over that time frame. So he's pushing the ball downfield with accuracy, in frame, in structure, so his, play, his players can make the play with the ball after catching it. Which which one? I think that there were real genuine strides there made from the accuracy department. Comfortability. You made a point about week eight. I just talked a little bit about this uh, – this point with Brad Ward where I kind of viewed the first seven weeks as a get to know each other thing. You know, everybody was growing to who they were, what the concepts were. They got no preseason. They got an abbreviated training camp. There was a lot that went into that Cody. And I think, I think that that should be understood. And then if you look at when he started to become comfortable with who he had around him, what the scheme was, what his coach liked to call what his coach knew he liked, it started to click. That's why there should be huge levels of optimism because the dream has always been to get Baker with a play caller who can start to understand him as a quarterback, right? That's the biggest thing he needs. The guys that win with their arm and their mind, Drew Brees, Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, found long-term play callers who understood them and they worked hand-in-hand -hand over long periods of time to become comfortable with what they like to do. That's, that's what the hope is with Baker, uh, and that's what is really the most – makes me feel the most optimistic about him. Let's go to your next category, the deep ball, which is where he really – I think he really shined this past season. Yeah, I, I like in the deep ball in the NFL to kind of like, like the long the long ball in golf. I mean, sure. not to mention Bryson and Brooks Kepka, what's going on with those two guys right now. But <laughs> uh, the deep ball, it, it, he thrived in 2018 when he came in the league. Um, actually, first, from that last section we talked about weeks 9 through 17 – when Kitchens took over with Al Saunders, with Kenny Zampezi, when we look at throws specifically 20 yards or greater downfield, Mayfield was first in adjusted completion percentage. 53.7% of his balls were completed over that depth, passing depth. He was third in touchdowns with seven, and he was fifth in passer rating over that, over that depth. Um, around 16% of his throws were 20 yards greater downfield, so he was pushing the ball down the field at that time, and he really, really got into a rhythm there without even a really a, a great deep threat on the team at the time. There was nobody, like not to get ahead, but there wasn't an Anthony Schwartz on the team at the time. There was not a Will Fuller, a deep threat guy. There wasn't anybody there. He made plays with what he has, and that's something I think he's really been good with thus far in his career. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Well, we, you talked. Did you talk there about 2020 and the kind of resurgence from 2019 a little bit? Yeah, in 2019, he, he was pretty much right back to where he was in, in 2018. He was fourth in positive play percentage, which when we say positive play percentage, that, that's a scenario where the team had a positive 
expected points added or just consider that a successful play for the offense. 51.9% of his throws of at that depth, 20 yards better, were considered positive plays. Um, mm-hmm. He was seventh in EPA, and he was fifth in on-target percentage at that depth. Again, I think that could be even better going forward with the addition of Anthony Schwartz, a guy with a 4 2 5 40, a guy that could take the top off the of defense, create mismatches, not only down the field, but in the yak game, and also open up some stains in the middle underneath as well. Um, the one thing we also mentioned in the piece was that if we look at the top 11 scoring offense from last year and points per game, five of those were in the top 10 in deep ball pass attempts. So it's a good thing when you can push the ball downfield, not just a good thing to push it downfield. You also have to be really good at it, and that's what Baker is right now. <clears throat> at least that's the ceiling we saw last year. They, the, you mentioned Schwartz. There could be more of that coming. You get Odell back. They would. They, I think they were. They were in like the fifty-two to fifty-five throws, twenty yards downfield or more. Yeah, I think they would love to get that into the sixty-five, seventy range. So hopefully that happens. Talk about the Kevin Stefanski factor you highlighted. With Stefanski and Baker, I don't think you could have built a better offense around him in a lab. You know, you're talking about. 12 personnel, play action, and boot action. Play action has always been a strength for Mayfield throughout his three years in the NFL. Um, Even though Kitchens and Stefanski called relatively the same amount of plays from play action, it's 30 versus about 29%, you could see Mayfield this year really take his time with his his, uh, play action fakes. A lot of people, when they talk about play action, will be like, well, you need an effective ground game, which the Browns have in spades, obviously. There's no doubt about that. But that doesn't matter. What matters in play action you want to freeze those second-level defenders. And, and he deserves credit, Cody. He really – I was disappointed in how he – how much attention to detail he had in general in the season and, and how he came into the season, but how he carried himself in those play-action scenarios. He did not commit himself to it. There was a total reversal there. It's, unbel- if, it's unbelievable that, that from last year to this year. It's like last year, like, it was like he didn't have a quarterback coach. He was out there just yeah. swinging it. That's not to degrade anybody that was on that coaching staff at the time. I'm just saying those play-action fakes last year weren't even play-action fakes. He rushed through it. There was no attention to detail, and nobody bought the fakes. Yep. If you look at this year, he's taking his time. He, he was uh, – and not just taking his time with his fakes and freezing the defenders. I think the receivers were also running more advantageous routes via the play-action schemes. And we talk about play-action, but I think we'd be remiss if we didn't mention boot action as well. A little bit of misdirection. Get Baker out of the pocket, maybe some better at flurry lanes, and um, play to his strengths. That's what Stefanski does, not just with Mayfield, but with everybody on the team. I know we only have one year of data, one year of game film, but he seemingly has a knack right now of putting players in the best position to succeed, and that's play and boot action with Baker Mayfield at this point in his career. Yeah, I was talking about that with Brad Ward, a show I was just on, is how exciting it will finally get to maybe have not, – not maybe, we will get another year of data from this offense about personnel groupings and like looking back at Baker and how often they went to play action and all of those different things. It'll be really cool to finally have consistency and structure and coaching because you can compare what did – you know, what did Stefanski do in 2020 versus what did he do in 2023, 24, 25? Like, how is it changing over time? That that thing will be really fun to track. I think it's an interesting thing. And look uh, at, we talk, go look ahead. At, sorry, sorry, enemy mean to interrupt you. Kind of look no, at the good. play calling tendencies too. Um, when you get that year on tape, everybody now sees what you did for the last year. You have to kind of revert those tendencies a little bit, maybe a little misdirection, change it up a little bit. But uh, also to quote Blue Chips, classic movie, if you haven't seen it, highly recommend. Um, Sometimes it's not what you do, it's how you do it. Even if you do become predictable, you have to do things absolutely correct, even if you are predictable in that scenario to be successful. Um, Without a doubt. That'll be something to see in 2021. Well, you talk about another coach on staff, and that's – you know, it's Bill Callahan. Talk talk about the effect that Bill Callahan has and – uh, we'll throw up here a little graphic that we have that, that our good friend Seth made uh, that covers this topic a little bit in depth. Well, kudos to Seth for the graphic, by the way. One of the best Fantastic. in the business. Um, we talk about Bill Callahan, probably the best offensive line coach in football and one of the best of all time, without a doubt. Um, I know Andrew Barry, obviously with the player acquisition side, was bringing in Jack Conklin at right side to take over Chris Hubbard. That was a big change. Huge change to get protection on the front side for Baker Mayfield. And you also have to give him credit with Jedrick Wills Jr., a guy that went from right tackle at Bama, which was to his blind side. Okay, I understand it, but 
He's flipping the left tackle now. You have to completely switch that muscle memory um, when you move from that position right to left. And either Will said himself how much of an impact Callahan had on him um, and growing his game to the next level. And when, when we talk about Callahan, I think what, in Baker Mayfield, the correlation as we look at that graphic is how Baker is under pressure versus no pressure, no pressure meaning a clean pocket. Uh -huh. um, we look at those categories, you could see the differentials between on target drops by 13.7%. His adjusted net yards per attempt dropped by 6.5. Touchdown percentage, how many of his throws went for a touchdown, went by 1.5%. Passer rating drops by 50. EPA was dropped by almost 176 points when he's in under pressure versus no pressure. That's with direct credit to both Callahan with his teaching abilities and also with AB, with bringing in the talent of the guys to protect Baker Mayfield up front to give him some time to get to the playmakers. Everybody talks about, oh, we're surrounding this guy with this guy, with this guy and this guy. I don't care how much talent you have on the outside, at talent, at running back, at tight end. If you have no time to throw the ball, it doesn't matter. Look at Joe Burrow. It's a scar on his knees telling you right now, it doesn't matter how much talent he has on the outside. If he has 2.2 seconds per throw, you need more time to get him the ball. Yeah, you want you want a lot more no pressure situations than you do those those pressure situations. The thing that Baker's got to get better at is how he handles pressure. I think that that's a big next level to unlocking him. Uh, and I'm curious as we kind of close here, Cody, what what do you see as a successful season from Baker Mayfield? Like when we look back at at the end of 2021, what what, what sorts of things make you think, okay, I I needed to see him do this. And he showed me that this year. I think you just said one, which was dealing better with pressure. And we, we see, obviously, how bad the advanced metrics are in that scenario. He's playing behind the best line in football. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But there's going to be times when you're facing the TJ Watts of the world where you're going to have to get better with that ball quickly and effectively. So I want to see him better under pressure. Um, statistically, I want to see, similar to last year, a three to one, two and a half to one touchdown interception ratio. Make sure you're taking the ball. Don't revert back to that 2019 where you're just dishing the ball out left and right. I know he's an inherently aggressive quarterback by nature, throws into some tight windows, but take care of the ball. Win the turnover differential, and your team will have um, a good win, win to loss ratio. Um, QB wins are obviously a myth. That's not a real thing. We got to get back to the playoffs. And yeah, I think a lot of it ride, does ride on him and his performance, taking care of the ball, getting the ball to Beckham to Higgins, to Hooper, getting the running backs involved in the passing game more. I think that's a big growth factor for him and Stefanski, mm -hmm. it, especially Nick Chubb. I know we talk about Kareem Hunt, and even with Dimitri Felton, he's going to be an asset, come out of the backfield or even in the slot. Get Chubb the ball, too. He can get the ball on the screens and the flats, and uh, that's probably the three biggest right there. I would say, too, something that I would love to see on top of that is, you know, Baker had a great amount of success – and uh, and this is not a predictable thing year to year. When when you're working outside of structure, uh, it's it, your success is really not something. If you have a good year with that, it's not predictable year to year. You talk to anybody who covers this stuff; they'll tell you the same. Because it, when you break down from a play in chaos or you get out of the pocket, you cannot predict where DBs are going to be, and you can't predict where your own guys are going to be and the scramble drill comes into play, and all that stuff happens. So it's tough to say like consistently successful stuff happens outside of the pocket year to year. Baker was really good outside of structure in 2018, his rookie year. He found a lot of success. Think back to the Carolina play where he's floating to his left out of the pocket and hits that ridiculous window to Jarvis in the left corner of the end zone against the Panthers at home. I was actually, I was actually at that game. That was right in front of me. It was yeah. wild. And, and yeah. those plays he can do, he can make those plays. He had a lot of success in 18. He had some in 2019. In 2020, I just don't think the ball bounced his way outside of the pocket. I thought he missed some people that were turning up field at the last moment. There was a play in the Washington game, I remember specifically. One in um, – I think there was one in Jacksonville that he really missed. He just didn't see him. That's a part of the unpredictability. I would like to see Baker – see some of those bigger shots he can make when he gets out of chaos. I know we want him to become more comfortable, uh, and he's going to have to keep winning from the pocket, and I thought he made great strides there. But I want to see him in 2021 
make some big plays outside of the pocket. You know, think about the turnover in Kansas City where he throws into that chaos that Tyron Matthew picks it off there. So he needs to be better. If he can continue to improve where he has been from the pocket, get keep making strides the way he did in 2020, but then add some success uh, that, that is reminiscent to his 2018 uh, when he gets out of the pocket, that's when you're looking at a 4,000-yard, 35-touchdown type of season. So that's what I would love to that's see. Cody, goal. man, I think this is – it is. It is. If he yep. can make the best of both worlds, there is is where he finds the big, big, big seasons for him. And that's stuff. Like I said, that's the difference between one year of throwing twenty eight touchdowns and one year of throwing thirty four, thirty five, or even more. That's just the little little differences. And plus, he gets an extra game this year. That'll help. So, Cody, yeah. this has been great, man. Guys, go read that article. It's really enlightening. We talked about a lot of things from it, but there's also a lot of things in the writing that are there too. And, and Cody will answer any questions you have in comments or Twitter or whatever. Uh, he's at Cody Sweck on Twitter. He keeps it very simple. It's his name. So no under, no underscores, no numbers. It's, uh, Muck, it's nice like great that. Imagination. <laughs> well, Jake <laughs> Burns was creative. taken. I tried, I tried to use that one. It was taken. So I had to, I had to use mine, I, my limited imagination, but brother, this was good, man. I really appreciate you, Cody. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me on. Of course, guys, that's a wrap for today's episode. Thanks again to Cody uh, taking some time away from his family to join us tonight. Make sure to read his article. Join us at the OBR, dollar for your first month. We appreciate your support for our journalism and our efforts, and I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. We'll be back with one more. We might be starting the OBR chalk talk session with John Stephenson tomorrow, which I will be pretty pumped about. We will have on the OBR's uh, YouTube channel here, and we'll put it in audio form as well. So, Thanks for joining us, guys. We'll have so much more on Baker throughout the rest of the offseason, and Cody will be spearheading our data behind that, and a thank you to him as well again. So, guys, see you later, and until next time, go Browns. See you guys.